Anybody else ever notice that Kim Shire's drinking wine at like nine in the morning in that video? I thought that I've been meaning to point that out for weeks now. So I think probably like like everybody else, I continue to try to reconcile what it is that we're experiencing and what it looks like to move forward with some kind of wisdom and courage and caution all at the same time. And the question that's been really rolling around in my head this week is this question of, I wonder if what we need in this present moment is really, really discerning leadership. And by leadership, I'm not necessarily thinking of presidents or prime ministers or governors or even superintendents, though I would certainly include all of those kind of high-level leadership roles within it, but I'm thinking more of parents, of community members, of business owners, of 12-year-olds with suddenly more time on their hands than ever, of little league managers. I'm I'm thinking of all of us, really. And and by discernment, I don't mean this kind of pretentious black and white moralism so much as what I mean, I guess, is to to me, discernment is about the ability to put all the options on the table, to, to know really what it is that we're facing, really what it is what we're deciding, really what it is what's in front of us, and then to have this hyper-wise ability to sift through the different options and know which one's best. And what stands out to me right now is that fear is everywhere. And, and, and it comes in from every direction and has all kinds of different logic to it. I was talking this week to a friend and got his permission to share this story that he, he has a friend who's a, a chaplain at a, at a Catholic school. And There was an email sent out at this school this week. It was an all-staff email, and it included the idea uh, that that said our our highest goal is to keep people safe. And my friend's friend, this chaplain person, got themselves in a little bit of trouble because they replied all and and said, really? Like, where in the gospel do we come to the conclusion that safety is the chief end of people? And yet I think we have sympathy of where that's coming from, of that there's, there's danger everywhere. And, 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 and so when I think about this, this need for discernment, it strikes me that one of the things that we're facing is w- which fears, which dangers, which threats will we allow to, to drive the way we live and which ones will we not? Like, which fears will we allow to manage our behavior and which ones won't we? I mean, the reality is... Uh, we, we could fear dying, and that's a very real threat. And yet we have to hold that somehow in tension with the fact that on the one hand, we could die. Uh, on the other hand, we, we could experience a type of isolation that is generally reserved for the worst criminals. And, and I'm not trying to suggest that we're overreacting. I'm not trying to suggest that we're underreacting. Well, what stands out to me is that we've got to start discerning which fears are we going to listen to. I mean, there's the the legitimate fear that that our kids could function as vectors in the community. But how do we hold that intention with the fear that suddenly our 10-year-old, our 14-year-old, our 18-year-old could be spending nine hours a day staring at a screen? And and, and how do we manage that? I just learned this week that, that many of the online pornography sites have actually opened up access, no subscription fee required. So, so how do we manage the, the fear of death or the fear of our kids contracting something that... I don't want to trivialize it with, with the fear that they would develop an addiction that they'll battle for the rest of their lives. How, how, do we, how do we balance what it means to be a responsible, cautious citizen with what it means to be lonely and depressed? And I ask those questions because as we continue in this kind of exile conversation, part of what stands out to me is part of what people in exile did was they, they, they were invited, or part of what they experienced is they were invited to really discern which fears mattered. They, they, they went through an experience and we have the luxury of seeing the recollection of their experience and the wisdom that they gleaned from their experience and part of what we get to see is how did they make sense of the decisions they made? And after the fact, what fears did they decide were important and which ones weren't? I was talking to some of our middle school leaders this week and, and they, they were sharing that one of the things that they're experiencing as they talk to some students is that there's this like almost, well, I don't, I don't know what you'd call it, seething or, or low-grade anger. Because what they see is, is a kind of hypocrisy in us adults. That they're being told they have to isolate, they have to stay alone, they can't have contact, they can't have their acta- activities, but in many cases, their parents are getting theirs. And again, I think this speaks to this idea of how, how do we discern? 
as, as functioning leaders of a household, of a business, of a community, how do we discern which fears are we going to allow to control us and which ones aren't we? And, and that's where the baseball thing comes in. I, several years ago when my boys started playing baseball again, first my oldest and then middle and then eventually my, my last one, I, I, I didn't own any baseballs and I wasn't privy to the, how much, to, to the degree that baseball had changed since I played it when I was a kid. And of course, one of the first things I noticed is that now all the dads carry a bucket around full of baseballs. And I'm a German hushka who would never think of buying baseballs. And so while they were practicing, I started walking the tall grass and just picking up whatever baseballs I could find, slowly filling my own bucket so that we could practice, so, that we could, so I could throw it to them in the batting cage. I have more than a couple memories of long after everybody else had left the complex, my boys and I would just, for a half an hour, walk the perimeter and walk the outfields and pick up whatever baseball we could find. And, and, and initially, so long as it looked something like this, so long as it was, was round, had red laces, so long as it met the general description of a baseball, it went in our bucket. We, we, we were non-discriminating. We, we just took them all in. But then over time, and especially today, I have this more discerning process of determining which baseballs I'm going to use and which ones aren't. Because actually, it, was, it might shock you, there's actually quite a variety of baseballs out there. I mean, there's, there, there's this one, and this, uh, not the perfect example, but there's the t-ball baseball. Uh, we've actually used them at Narrate before. They're soft. They, they, they look like a baseball. In some ways, they, they feel like a baseball, but but they actually function more like a tennis ball or a racquetball. The, the design of these is for kids who are just learning to play catch, for, for kids who, who are trying to introduce the sport to, but don't want to give them the ne negative experience of getting hit in the skull with a hard ball. And so th there's, there's these. Uh, but the downside of these is obvious. Like you, you can't really hit it anywhere. It's more like hitting a tennis ball than a baseball. And, and if you try to hit a grounder, then all you get are these big chopping bounces. And to pitch it is a little bit weird because, again, it's, it's, it's soft. And then there's, there's this kind of baseball. And this might be what maybe the next step up. And, and this, this, again, it looks like a baseball, uh, but it doesn't feel like one. And that's because uh, the cover is actually made from plastic. And when it's brand new, it can hide that fact. But after just a few uses, you suddenly realize you're not actually holding a leather baseball, you're holding a plastic baseball. And even internally, its makeup is different. The integrity of it is different. Inside of a, a real baseball is string, then yarn, then a rubber ball. Inside this is a little bit of string and solid cork. And so in those early days of playing baseball with my boys, uh, initially, I would throw this one in my bucket, but then quickly what you learn is uh, even a 10-year-old who hits this thing hard in the batting cage can turn it into an egg-shaped object, not a round object. And then there's this, and this, this, this is a real leather baseball. Uh, the integrity of it is what a baseball ought to have. It's string, yarn, and a rubber ball. It has a leather cover. It has the red laces. It, it's, its value is its price point. Where it's not a bouncy ball. And it's not a plastic ball, it's a leather ball, but it's in that middle range of prices. But the downside of it is while it's leather, the, the leather, after just a little bit of use, it, it starts to peel. It's the oddest thing. I still don't even understand why it happens this way. But after a few slides across, us, across the ground, you can actually kind of peel the leather off of it. And by the time it gets to this stage, it doesn't feel like a baseball at all because it's, it's just so rough. It's perfect for leagues. It's perfect you know, for, for those situations where you need a lot of baseballs, but you don't want to spend $20 a ball. And then, there's, and then there's this one. This is a real, genuine Major League Baseball. It has all the upsides. It's real leather. The integrity is there. And even after prolonged use, you may not want to use it in a game, but, but, but the outside will, will maintain a texture that it's still usable in practice for a very long time. The downside is it's 20 bucks a ball. See, the, my point here is that part of what I learned in, in this whole baseball thing is today I, I'm what you would call a baseball snob. My friend Justin probably shares the same thing. Now, uh, a, a baseball that I would have before picked up and threw in my bucket, I'll just, I'll just leave lying on the ground now. And I think, to whatever degree what my experience, and I think my experience with God is helpful, I think the season we're moving into is a season where the responsibility is on us to enter into our own discernment process with fear and decide within ourselves with great intentionality and with those we love, which fears are we going to play the game with? Like the reality is, you can't play baseball without a baseball. 
But you have a lot of choice over which kind you're going to play the game with. And I wonder if part of what people learned in exile is you can't do life without fear. What you can do is enter into a intentional discernment process by which you decide which fears are you going to allow to control you, to impact your decisions, and, and which ones are you not going to allow to do that. One of the places where I think we see this playing itself out is, is in the story of Isaiah. And Isaiah is this brilliant Old Testament book. I'll give a little context in a second, but in chapter 8, it starts this way. For the Lord spoke thus to me while his hand was strong upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people. So the context here, of course, is what we have, what we see here is Isaiah's had a really good cup of coffee and a really good morning and a really strong connection with, the God and he's, with, with God, and he's saying, I had this really strong sense. Now, the greater context is this, just in, by way of review, but also I think it's important. Isaiah was doing his, Isaiah lived over 100 years before the exile happens. But the book of Isaiah spans a much longer time frame than that. And there's great debate about how many authors there really are. But all the same, the, the situation, the context of Isaiah was, there's this empire called Assyria. Later it would be Babylon, but initially it was Assyria. And they're gaining a head of steam and their function is more and more of a threat to these small, small little countries like Judah, like Israel. And these little countries are freaking out and they're trying to come up with a way to, to manage the threat of Assyria because Assyria is trying to become another massive empire. And what some of them are doing is they're going down to Egypt and going, hey, could we become your allies? But that has a cost and the cost affects not, not just your own commerce and your own economy, but it also affects your religion. A completely different spiritual system. A completely different kind of king. The other option that some of them are employing is they're just forming their own alliances and they're building th these these kind of minor little alliances and by which they think they'll stand up together to Assyria. But the unique thing about what, what gives the context to Isaiah is, is that if Isaiah is hearing God correctly, then, then Isaiah's message to Israel, to Judah rather, is don't do that. God doesn't want you to do that. And it sounds a little simplistic to our ears, but all the same, God's message to Isaiah was just trust me. Don't unite with other kingdoms. Don't unite with one another. Trust me in all of this. That's the context of 11. Verse 12 says this, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what it fears or be in dread. Now again, let me just clarify. I'm not suggesting that COVID is a conspiracy. I'm not of that camp. I'm not even necessarily suggesting that we've dramatically overreacted. That's not my point here. It's not my agenda. But it is interesting, isn't it? That here you have a people whose experience of God is a God going, be careful with what you fear. And be careful lest you just assume that the outside culture's fears are the ones that ought to drive your behavior. It's eerie. I've been noodling on this one for weeks and just this week was like, I, 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 gotta, I gotta go here in our, in our gatherings. Do not fear what they fear. Do not dread what they dread. But then listen to verse 13. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Now, this is a kind of a crazy verse. I remember when I was brand new to following Jesus in my early 20s, Stan Simmons, this great leader at this great church, I remember him saying then, and it must have been in my early 20s because I wasn't there very long, but I remember him saying, I spent the first 20 years of my career convincing people to not be afraid of God. And I, had spent, I intend to spend the last 20 years of my career helping people develop a healthy fear of God. See, the, the tension here is, is, is huge because... If we're not careful, we, we, we can come to the conclusion that fearing God is something that we've ran from on our own spiritual journey. It's about an angry, vindictive God who takes pleasure in sitting behind a throne and, and sending people into some kind of eternal torment. But if we can allow that's not really what fear of God is, then maybe we can move towards what it really is, what it really means to fear God. And see, part of what we see in the book of Isaiah 
Part of what we experience in a very real sense is these people, and again, my personal belief is that Isaiah was finally compiled after the exile had occurred, and so as much as anything, we're getting their recollection of the stories that really mattered, that really made sense of things for them. In the same way that we maybe say in a year or five years from now, look back on this time and go, what was really true during that time? Isaiah represents that wisdom, that refined content. And part of what we see over and over and over again in Isaiah is a people who are reconciling that they forgot what it meant to be accountable. They forgot that they were dust, that they were stewards of God's breath. They forgot that someday they would live their lives and then they would go before God and in a sense answer to God for what they'd done with their life. It's the creation covenant that the story is not always about how much God loves you. God loves you. But sometimes the story is about a God who says, I have a job for you to do. I have a people for you to be. C.S. Lewis once wrote a paper which became a selection of papers which became a book. And the book is called God in the Dock. God in the Dock what was C.S. Lewis beginning to, to reconcile or wrestle with that his observation was that part of what happened with the Western Enlightenment was we flipped the script. I always thought the dock referred to a boat. It doesn't. The dock refers to a courtroom. And what C.S. Lewis was saying over 50 years ago, I think that's right chronologically, what he was saying was that pre-Western enlightenment and really pre-Western culture, people in general, kind of no matter what their religion, they, they lived with the sense that they would live a life and they would, then they would go before a God and they'd be held accountable for how they lived. So God in the dock, it's the idea of a person in a courtroom standing before God and answering. But really what God in the dock is about is he says Western culture and the enlightenment flipped the script. That no longer do we see ourselves as going before God and answering for our lives, but now God's on trial. His, his, his sense, maybe even call it his fear, was that we're going to so flip culture around that we no longer live life from the perspective that we will answer to God for what we did, but instead we've put God on trial. He has to live up to our standards rather than us to God's. All the same, what we see in Isaiah here, him shall you fear, him shall you dread, is a people who were, who were there's really a couple things I think that we can observe. One is Isaiah recognizes that fear is not optional. There's no way to play the game of baseball without a baseball. You just have to decide what kind of baseball. And every kind you decide has a cost and a benefit, a benefit and a cost. If you're going to go with low cost, then that'll get you some things and it'll cost you some things. If you're going to go with safety, it'll accomplish some things and it'll cost you some things. Isaiah seems to, to, to just have owned fear is not optional. You're going to fear something. You're going to fear someone. Which leads to the second point that I think is worth stating, and that is that his focus has moved toward being intentional about what exactly we're going to fear. See, exile is about worst-case scenario. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, but, but worst-case scenario has a way of auditing fear. I was talking to a friend early in this process who's a cancer survivor, and, and he said even then, Adam, I, I've, I, I've, I've battled cancer, I've faced death, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of death anymore. That's not the fear that controls me. Exile is about experiencing worst case scenario to such an extent that we catch ourselves going, okay, now that I've experienced what was the worst, maybe that wasn't the worst. Maybe I need to think about what fears actually do matter. See, what happened in, in Israel's exile, or Judah rather's exile, was King Nebuchadnezzar, as we've talked about, came to Jerusalem, flattened the city, destroyed the temple, killed all the king's officials. Think cabinet, Senate, Congress, House of Representatives, the, the, the whole lot, lobbyists, the, the whole deal, the governors. Then they, then they arrested the king, and we know from even extra biblical historical sources, the king spent the rest of his life in prison in the capital, in Babylon. But before they arrested him, they blinded him. And before they blinded him, they actually made him watch the systematic execution of every one of his sons. There's two reasons. One was, of course, in a monarch monarchical understanding of the world, they were demonstrating to him that there's no hope, that you're 
family will ever be on the throne again. The other was that they wanted his last visual memory to be that of the blood-curdling cries of his sons. This is the stuff Israel processed in exile, but this is what caused them to go, wait, wait a minute. We were afraid of losing our country. We did anyway. We were afraid of losing our lives. We did anyway. We were afraid of losing the throne. We did anyway. Isaiah 13, 8, 13, to me represents a people who had this wake-up moment of like, wait a minute, we drifted. We feared the wrong things. We forgot that there's a God who invites us to live our lives on his behalf. We forget that there's a Jesus who walked out of the tomb alive, who composed a song and invited us to play it for the world. We forgot all about that. Now, if this is all true, then there's another story read through exile that I think takes on new meaning. See, there's another people early in their history who were in exile. They were in Egypt. You may or may not know the story, but as we're told, that they were there for hundreds of years and they were crying out to God to send a deliverer, but they were under a power greater than themselves, a king they could not conquer. And eventually, Moses bumped into God, or God Moses, whichever order it happened in, and God said to Moses, Moses, I've heard the cries of my people. You're going to go liberate them. And Moses said, well, I've got to tell them who sent me. Because remember, remember this, is, this is a monolatrous culture. Now, you, you may believe that your God alone was all-powerful, but everybody, including the Jews, believed in a plethora of gods. And so there was this clarification, like, wait a minute, which God am I telling them is going to deliver them? And God, for the first time in the biblical account, as I understand it, says, my name is I am. And Moses says, okay, well, now that I can tell them who you are, who sent me, who am I? There's this moment of self-doubt. There's this moment of fear. And God says, fear is illegitimate. God says, you should never be afraid. No. God says to Moses, I will be with you. And he was. And it seems that the message there, the story there, is a God who, who doesn't call us to find the life that's free of fear, but a God who calls us to, to find the right mission, that, that to be brave doesn't mean an absence of fear. It means to not be controlled by the wrong fears. There's this great therapist that, that I've been learning a lot from. He defines fear this way. Go ahead to that next slide. He says, fear is the inability to believe that you can deal with the consequences. And it seems like God's message to Moses is, because I'm with you, you can deal with whatever consequences that come up. Fast forward then, there's a guy named Jesus who, who we think is the Messiah, who, who we think is king, who we think reigns today, who walked out of the tomb alive. And one of the things that's always frustrated and confused me about Jesus was his most repeated command is fear not. Well, I think this is one of those instances when we, when we read the Bible through a Jewish lens, it starts to make more sense. Because in the Gospel of John, one of the things I didn't know until recently after doing a real slow read through John is that Jesus, arguably his best friend on earth, John, who wrote this gospel of John years after his resurrection, John, John is telling a story about a Jesus who's like Moses, only better. Moses alluded to a new leader who would show up and bring a new kind of liberation. John is very much, if you read it slowly, there's all kinds of parallels between Jesus and Moses. Only this Moses is God, so to speak. And in John chapter 6, we have one of those moments where Jesus is walking on the water and the disciples are in the middle of the lake and they're terrified and many of the gospel writers have some account of something like this. And Jesus' response when they see him is simply this, it is I, do not be afraid. Again, that, those, that command has always frustrated me. As someone who battles anxiety, which is really a fear battle, it's, it's felt unscientific and unkind and illogical. I know from people who have done military training or police training or even medical training that we have very little control over our initial response if we've not been exposed to it. So to say fear not just seems unkind to me. But here's the context. When read through the lens of Moses and when read through the original language, it is I is actually literally translated I am. So Jesus shows up and says, I am. And his Jewish audience, both in the boat and the original readers of John, would have went back to where? <laughs> to Moses. 
And Jesus' follow-up statement is what? Do not be afraid. What if, what if God isn't calling you to go searching for the life that has no risk? What if to pursue a life that experiences no fear is, is a vain pursuit? It doesn't exist. You can't play the game without a ball. What if times like this, and exile in particular, is this stark reminder that part of the work of what it means to be a healthy human and part of the work of what it means to be a healthy follower of God, and especially one in community, is, is to practice a, a kind of discernment. One that puts all the options on the table and spends the energy to be self-aware of what are the options. And as we pay attention to what those options are, to then enter into a very intentional process, knowing that God is with you doesn't mean there's no fear. God is with you means he's in you in, with you inside the fear, despite the fear. What if what we need right now is really discerning leadership? A process by which we do some filtering. We pay attention to some things and, and, and we make sure that the right fears are driving us. There's a couple challenges that, that I just want to issue your way and I guess the advantage of being online is I'll I'll never know whether you roll your eyes or do them or not. One of them is, I, I think Isaiah 8.13 ought to be put in that, that list of verses that are worth memorizing. And I don't memorize many verses. Dallas Willard influenced me years ago when he said it's the most important spiritual discipline. And in my recent growth and anxiety, I've come to realize in that respect, he's right. When I'm triggered for an hour or a week or a month, quiet times and Many other things are of no use to me, but the verses that I've memorized, I can cycle them sometimes hundreds of times a day. Just last night, I woke up and cycled one verse for probably an hour. I only have two right now. One is something Paul said to Timothy, for God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. For God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. And to me, it's a reminder again of which pathways are God's and which our prevailing cultures. The other one is another verse from Isaiah. I think it's 25.3, though I usually don't worry about references. It's, he will keep in perfect peace him whose, heart, him whose mind is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. He will keep in perfect peace him whose heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. I think this one's worth add, adding. I'm working on an amalgamation of the message version, the NRSV. Do not worry about what they worry about. Do not fear what they fear. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy. He's the one that's important. Him you shall fear. Him you shall dread. And quite frankly, I think if we're relying upon any other source to do this for us, we're not going to get it done. CNN is not going to lead us down a healthy navigation of which fears matter. And to be fair, Fox News isn't either. The CDC is likely not, likely not to help either. It strikes me that this is one of those seasons where, where healthy Christ-following people in community with people they love and trust have to enter into a process. And so memorizing that's one thing. And the second thing is I, I, think, I think we've got work to do. And quite frankly, I think if we're not careful, we're going to drift weeks and months down the road and realize that we've been controlled by this one fear that quite frankly is antithetical to everything it means to follow Jesus. I don't think that chaplain was so wrong, personally. Remember, we are dust. And if the chief quest becomes physical survival, then these people and this God would say that we should be pitied because it's, it's an unachievable goal. What if we've got work to do? And it's not important that we all even come to the same conclusion, but we've got work to do to identify what are the fears, what's being floated out in front of us, and which ones are we going to allow to really drive the lives that we're living, the relationships we're forming, the, the priorities that we're living within. I want to end with this quote from C.S. Lewis, excuse me, from N.T. Wright in a book called God in Public that's messing with my paradigm. He wrote it in 2016, but I think it's an appropriate capstone to all of this. He says, the newspaper perspective, and we don't have it on the screen, sorry, this is a last minute deal. The newspaper perspective is like someone who only walks down a certain street 
on the one day a week when people put out the garbage for collection, and who then reports that the street is always full of garbage. Christians ought not to collude, collude with the sneers. Walk down the street some other time, we ought to say. Come and see us on a normal day. What fears will you and won't you allow to drive things for you? Let, let, let me pray. God, Lord, this, to whatever degree Isaiah 8 applies to our day, it's, there's landmines everywhere and the potential for misinterpretation and overinterpretation is, is everywhere. And so, God, we're grateful that your spirit uh, is alive and well and helping us understand your will. God, my prayer would be that, that a month from now and six months from now and five years from now, uh, we'd be able to stand proudly in front of a mirror and recognize that, that there was a process when we slowed everything down a little bit and we entered into a really intentional conversation about what are the things we should and what are the things that we shouldn't fear. And what are the fears that ought to control us and what are the ones that shouldn't? And God, to whatever degree your pathway uh, invites us to step into some of our worst fears, I pray that you'd help us live in the, the constant awareness that your promise has always been to be with us, especially with us in the mission that you call us to. Amen. If you would like to learn more about Narrate Church, find us at narratechurch.org or look us up on Facebook and Instagram.